Thank you for that introduction, Gary. It's great to be here. Good to welcome Professor McKenna so you can see the, the fruits of all his investment, the people from the, uh, the School of Exercise Sciences, lots of collaborators, friends, and Luke. I've got a couple of jobs this morning. The first is to set the scene for what my group are going to present later, so you've got a good idea of what we're uh, up to. Uh, but the second one is to actually rebut Simon's comments about the dress code. And I put this in last night. Now, the first point I want to make here is, who on earth plans a conference in the middle of grant submission week? There's a couple of other take-home messages, though. Here is reading a PhD thesis. Who reads a PhD thesis in a suit, in a tie, in the garden. <laughs> I mean, dress code, come on. We have the last word on this. All right, so what do we study? I'm going to talk to you about what the Exercise Nutrition Group does. I'm going to leave the nuts and bolts to the people in my group who do all the work, who will talk to you later. But I just thought I'd set the scene for some of you who don't know what we do, particularly the people who are going to talk tomorrow uh, in an area which you know, may be a little bit unfamiliar to them. So this is what we're about. This is the, what I call the exercise and nutrition research matrix. With Dr. David Dunstan, who you're going to hear from later, who was standing at the back because he doesn't like sitting down for too long, uh, we study a spectrum of inactivity, prolonged sitting, which you'll hear from about uh, David, up to exercise. We look at energy availability, whether that's a surplus of energy in conditions uh, of pathology, or whether it's a lack of energy or a change of energy substrates. And Louise Burke, who is standing in a taxi at Melbourne Airport with 112 other people, will be talking to you about that this afternoon. We go from the spectrum of healthy populations right to disease populations. So we really do have a, a fairly comprehensive matrix there. How do we study these? various aspects that I've just discussed there. Well, we go from whole body physiology to muscle physiology, which I'll show you shortly in a minute. We have animal models in association with one of our collaborators at the St. Vincent's Institute, Professor Bruce Kemp. We have cell culture models set up, which Simon, I know you love, which is all his baby there. And we also have uh, knock-in and knock-out animal models as part of the collaboration with St. Vincent's. So we have a whole spectrum, and I think for the first time with the, with the investment that the university's put in, we have really a good chance of very high quality papers, because there's no doubt that grants and papers some days do depend on how sexy your models are, whether you've got certain knock-in, knock-out animal models, and for probably the first time in my career, I think we've got the, the whole spectrum covered there. So it's a pretty exciting place to be at the moment as we look ahead to the next two or three years. We're muscle-centric. That doesn't mean to say we don't care what goes on at the whole body level, but as I'll show you in the next few slides, and if you're a little bit squeamish, I'm going to show you a biopsy. You probably don't want to watch that, but this is what we do most days of the week. But skeletal muscle really is, if you like, mission control. And it's important for a number of reasons. In the average individual, not including some of the big guys in my group who are bodybuilders and powerlifters, it comprises around 50% of your total body mass. As far as governing things like your resting metabolic rate, which we can measure in our laboratory, it's very important. Generally, the higher the muscle mass, the higher the resting metabolic rate. And of course, the ratio of the muscle to fat tissue is also a very important factor when it comes to prognosis of disease. Obviously, skeletal muscle plays a major role in locomotion and also uh, has a dominant role in thermoregulation. But perhaps with regard to the pathology and some disease state, particularly metabolic syndrome and hyperglycemia, you've got to remember that 80% of a glucose load, so when you go to morning tea or lunch and ingest food, 80% of that load is disposed of in skeletal muscle. So if you have what we call insulin-sensitive skeletal muscle, which is quite capable of taking up that glucose load, you're in good health. we what you call insulin-sensitive. But if you have high lipids in the muscle and a variety of other conditions, signaling pathways go wrong, then this postprandial glucose disposal is disrupted. And that leads to the onset of hyperglycemia and a number of chronic morbidities and related conditions. So we think skeletal muscle is very important. So how do we measure this stuff? I'm going to show you a few signaling pathways, which always, you know, my eyes glaze over, but some of my students are really excited by this stuff. So 
you know, it's time we did face reality, but we do have some people in the lab who are quite capable of, of measuring a lot of this stuff. And this is what we do routinely. Um, the girls in the lab, who you'll hear from later, did a world first study. They started it the other day. We're taking biopsies and doing a circadian study. This is a study that's jointly funded by an ACU program grant and a Novo Nordisk Challenge grant with our collaborators in California at the Karolinska Institute. And some of my staff, and they're going to get me there for one trial I know, stayed up all night with two subjects to take biopsies every four hours. So we're going to do circadian metabolomics. Now I'm telling you this not to show you how good the team are, but they are very, very good, is that all the studies on which the literature is currently based are animal studies. And that's for a reason. People don't like to come in overnight and have biopsies every four hours, obviously. So this is a world first study, and if we can pull it off, it, it will be absolutely fantastic. The point here is that a lot of the data on which we're basing our studies is just literally animal work. So for the first time, we'll be doing human work. So we take biopsies usually from the vatus lateralis, the, the cyclist's legs would be down here and his feet down this end. We get about 150, 200 milligrams of muscle. Um, I'm not sure if the doctor, uh, his sample size declined throughout the night, did it? No, he's pretty good. No, he's pretty consistent. So we've got a very good doctor. You get, as you can see, they're about the size of a kernel of corn. And from that muscle, we can get an unbelievable amount of information. And if I go back to my undergraduate days, we used to measure muscle glycogen and then throw it away which now I look back and think that's absolutely criminal. Now we can send it to, you know, Jotin or Luke, our collaborators in other countries. They can measure a myriad of proteins, signaling pathways, and various other things. So we've got very good at measuring an awful lot more. Now one question I'll ask you at the end is, because we can measure an awful lot more, does that mean we know an awful lot more, and can we prescribe better? And I'm not too sure we've made that bridge yet, but certainly we can measure an awful lot more. So the biopsy is a metabolic probe which we use as an invasive tool to try and find out what's going on and drill down in skeletal muscle, because we believe skeletal muscle has a major influence on whole body metabolic dynamics. And it becomes pretty obvious very early on in the game that you've got different sorts of protein in the muscle. And I'm just going to give you an example from, if you like, the sport and then go back into the health and disease population. So if you look at a general classification of muscle proteins, and Luke's lab is one of probably three or four in the world to measure this, which is why we've teamed up with him. There's two types of protein, myofibrilla and mitochondrial. And the myofibrilla is, if you like, the grunt protein. If you're a sprinter, if you're a big rugby player, this is the protein that you want a lot of myofibrillar protein. If you're a long distance runner, uh, an endurance athlete, you tend to have more mitochondrial proteins. And if you look at the phenotypes, the body types of the two different athletes, they're very divergent. And there's a reason for that. Now, if we go one step further, we can actually see that when it comes to looking at signaling proteins in the muscle, not surprisingly, the proteins that turn on the profile to generate muscle size, hypertrophy, are quite distinct from those which are turned on to generate a more aerobic or what we call mitochondrial aerobic capacity. So it's no mistake that whoever designed us, probably shouldn't say that in this building, but whoever did design us was very clever and she designed us in such a way that this pathway here and this pathway here are not necessarily mutually exclusive, but they are differentiated. And those of you who try and train for both sports, and we've got uh, individuals in my group studying this at the moment will realize that if you try to train for that and that, there's a little bit of interference. You can't be the biggest and strongest at the same time as being the best endurance athlete that your body will allow you to be. We call that, you know, uh, if you like, the concurrent training effect or the interference effect. And there's a, probably a molecular underpinning for that. And they're the sort of questions that we're trying to answer in, in some of our studies. And this is from a study which uh, actually Nolan, who's in the audience here, he did this when he was in Sydney in David James's lab. We're hoping he can repeat such stellar work while he's down with us. And I just want to illustrate a point here. Uh, Nolan had a group of subjects, only four humans here, exercise, do a strenuous bout of exercise, and looked at what we call phosphoproteinomic analysis to see what proteins were turned on. And you know, that's a, that's a horrible figure which I must get him to explain to me one day. But the point here is it turned on over a thousand different proteins. So one single exercise bout alone turns on a myriad of signaling pathways and proteins. So it's very, very complicated. 
And diet does similar things, perhaps not in that number, perhaps three or 400. But you can see as soon as you put an insult onto the skeletal muscle, such as exercise or diet, which I'll talk about in the second half, things start to happen. And again, I'll challenge Nolan and anyone who's in this field, in the omics field, it's great to reveal these targets. The question is now, how do we take the next step? What are we looking for? Are we looking for drug targets? Are we looking for other ways to activate these pathways? Because these are health-conferring pathways, and some of these proteins are very important in that. So this is very important science, and for the, for the first time possibly, we can go from the whole body right to the molecular and span literally that whole pathway and continuum. And I think, again, that's a very exciting position to be in. And this is even perhaps more exciting. If you don't believe me that skeletal muscle and not the heart, skeletal muscle is, trumps the heart by miles, all right? Just remember that in the debate tomorrow. Skeletal muscle talks to other organs. The heart doesn't do that. Cardiac output can't exceed venous return. Venous return comes from the muscle. End of discussion, sorry, but it is. Skeletal muscle myokines are a thing of the last decade. What are myokines? They're circulating factors released from skeletal muscle to talk to other tissues. They talk to the fat tissue. They talk to the brain. Skeletal muscle releases myokines or exosomes, whatever you want to call them, that talk to other tissues. And we call this crosstalk. So there is communication between skeletal muscle and other organs. That is a remarkable finding, and that is relatively recent. And, you know, people in Australia, Mark Fabrio led the field in here when he first discovered interleukin-6. We've teamed up with the team, Donnie Cameron and I, uh, with Bruce Spiegelman at Harvard University, has shown that certain uh, hormone-like substances regulate fat and beige tissue. And again, there's lots of other pathways which are being discovered. And this is a really, really exciting area. The fact that skeletal muscle can communicate and talk to other organs. And the latest one, a couple of papers which came out in cell metabolism late last year, shows quite clearly that skeletal muscle talks to bone. So there isn't an organ that skeletal muscle doesn't orchestrate. It is the conductor. The other organs are just minor players in that orchestra. So let's switch tack a little bit now and look, look at the health side of things. And one thing, because we've got a couple of grants in this area that we've started to get particularly interested in, is, is this circadian metabolomics, measuring things that happen over 24 hours. And I guess the model that we're starting with is we've got to disrupt circadian rhythms and then we're trying to rescue them. So there's a host of things that happen in the modern lifestyle now which disrupt the normal circadian rhythm. And this is, you know, any old slide that you can just pick from the internet. There are certain times of the day when certain things happen. Unless you've got Luke in your house at the moment, he's on European time, in which case he wakes up at two o'clock on the dot, which is kind of annoying. But that's because his circadian rhythm is such. And last night on the roof, I said to Jotin, who got here from the UK the other day, I said, you'll have the second day effect. This guy hasn't traveled to Australia. We do this nine time times a year. You know what I'm talking about, Simon. And sure enough, I said today, how did you sleep? He said, I slept really well from about 10 o'clock till 10.40, and then I was wide awake. So this is the second day effect that I warned you about. So we have these circadian clock rhythms, and they're very, very, very important. And our paradigm is such that, you know, we're kind of messing these up at the moment. So if we look at what we do, we work ridiculously long hours, some of us anyway. Some of us, me socialize extremely long hours eating round the clock and I'm just going to show you one study about nutrition so what we're doing is perturbing the normal circadian rhythm of the day which is why we're looking at it in our various studies and those of you who are interested can talk to the team afterwards I'm not going to drill down in that because we've only just started our studies so our model is that these factors and others you know if you want to live less than a healthy person just do shift work Shift workers have completely disrupted circadian rhythms. They live on average about 6.5 years younger. So that's, that's epidemiological hard data. These other things, though, are now creeping into our everyday way of life, and that's the thing that worries me somewhat. And they're important because, again, everything talks to everything in the body. So if we think about the gut, and we're not measuring this in our studies, although we are taking uh, stool samples, I'm reliably told by Evelyn, that will be sent to another laboratory, the whole circadian clock 
and the time of day that you eat affects the gut microbiome and the gut microbiota and that plays an enormous part in, in how you feel, when you're hungry, when you should eat and everything else. One concept that we have really become interested in, in natural fact, the muscle has just been sent off to our collaborators in California the other day and the guys have done a, a fantastic job on this, is the concept of what we call restricted eating patterns. Now I'd never heard of this and the reason I'd never heard of it is because we've only just done the first human study. All the other studies up to this point were done in animals. And the paradigm is such that if you have, and I'll show you a study in a minute in humans, if you have an open window of eating, in other words, if you graze throughout the day continually, you snack at night, and there is something, there is a late night feeding syndrome, apparently syndrome, of course, is when you've got a cluster of things you don't really know what the actual thing is itself. But if you have unrestricted eating here, your metabolic profile is worse than if you have a discrete window of food availability. So the study that we've done at the moment is to limit the food availability, in other words, have time-restricted feeding versus unrestricted feeding, and see how that affects the circadian clock. So the concept of having a restricted time, perhaps eight or 12 hours of the day where you eat, as opposed to grazing throughout the day and night, is, is particularly in the animal world, a fairly entrenched concept. Not quite sure what happens in humans yet, and next year we'll be able to tell you. And I really like this study, and I like this study because it's an introduction to something that David will talk about, hopefully, um, technology. And my students will tell you, I'm a dinosaur. I couldn't even find that app on my phone, by the way, and log in to vote. So can you do that for me, please, Evelyn? I'm an absolute dinosaur, but this is where technology is really good, and we've got some really neat toys, courtesy of, of Wayne again here. And this is one of them, and this is a great study. This is a smartphone app, and all they did is give it to overweight people, so every time they ate, they just said, yep, I've eaten, I've eaten. They took a picture of what they were eating, and they came up with, I'm not sure what you call these plots, but basically a diagram to show when people ate. So every time there's a dot on here, there's an eating occurrence. So there's hundreds of people in this study. It's not just one guy, you know, who's really fat and eating an awful lot. There's lots of people. These are the calorie events. These are all events. And the bottom line was they then went back and said, you're eating over 14 to 16 hours of the day, overweight people. Can we restrict your food intake with the application? We're going to tell you when to eat. We're going to ping you and say, right, it's time to eat. And the results were quite astounding, and I'm just going to cut to the conclusion slide in the, in the interest of time. Firstly, there was a bias towards eating late. 25% of energy only was consumed before lunch, and 35% after 6 o'clock. And one thing which Luke will talk to you about, and something which we've been working on for a lot of years, and so in his lab, is the concept of food distribution. And I'll just take a sidebar just for a minute. We in Luke's group have done many studies now to show that how you spread protein over the day is very important. And traditionally, if you think of your dinner last night, meat, steak, chicken, whatever it is, we have protein later in the day when we're going to bed, when the metabolic demands of the muscle may still be reasonably high. But now we know for a fact, we've done several studies, and Luke's group has also pioneered this, and also late feedings at night, is that you're better to spread your protein throughout the day. So protein spread throughout the day results in a better whole muscle response than if you just backload it. So we've changed, or trying to change, eating patterns of protein. They weren't concerned with protein, they were just concerned with meal intake. And they had overweight individuals who were eating, or had eating occasions, spread over 14 hours, which is quite a long while if you, if you think about a normal day. Okay, so these are what we call grazers. Then they're restricted to 10 to 11 hours, which I still think is, is a reasonably long time. We've restricted hours to less than that. For 16 weeks, they reduced body weight, were more energetic, improved their sleep patterns, and the benefits in the follow-up persisted for a year. So a simple strategy. They haven't eaten less, they've just eaten differently. Restricted eating. So we'll look at the results of those studies, hopefully in a year, and give you some more information. I'm just gonna finish on something which is very close to my heart, and Louise will talk about this later in her talk. And this is the message at the moment which is going around, led by some scientists in the field who I think should probably know better. And I think the message at the moment, if you pick up any magazine or newspaper, is that, you know, carbs are bad. We should be eating high-fat diets. We should be eating the ketogenic diet or the, 
paleo diet or whatever diet it happens to be. And I think there's a real mixed message here, you know, for health professionals, not just to athletes, but to the general public. But of course, the general public often look to high profile individuals. And so you get certain individuals come around and give lectures and talk about various things. We're also paid a squillion bucks by companies who make these products, but we won't go there for the time being. Promulgating the fact that, you know, high fat diets are now not only good for athletes, but are good for the general population. And you know, the cardiovascular guys will just think, what a, where's this message coming from, and pull their hair out. We do too, because we think it's very, very, very dangerous. And so I would say to the students, it's your job to go out there and educate people. I get many phone calls from journalists who want to talk about this very topic. Most of them aren't really interested in talking about facts or studies. They're just interested in what people are doing and what people are saying. And as a scientist, you should have a real problem with that. I'll leave you with a couple of slides here. Every year on the New York Times bestseller list, the best-selling books are recipe books. Yet the second bestsellers are diet books. So, you know, go work that out. And of course, America, offense if there are too many Americans in the audience, has the highest degree of obesity. There are 2.4 million Americans who weigh over 210 kilos. Of course, they don't say it in kilos because they're not in SI units. So that's 460 pounds. You know what, I get most of them sitting next to me on my flights as well. <laughs> Why don't we just weigh the luggage and the person? How can you have a 50 kilo person with 20 kilos of luggage charged excess when you've got a guy standing next to you who's 115 kilos? I, I don't understand that. David will talk about inactivity. I've specifically left that for you, David, but this is the, and don't be offended by this, probably shouldn't, I should have deleted one word. This is the economics uh, slide gone backwards. I think you've seen it as the next slide. Apologies. This is the take home message. There have been major breakthroughs of how stuff works. There's no question about that. Guys in my lab measure stuff which I didn't even know existed 10 years ago. Now our job I think in the next decade is to link all these miraculous and wonderful cellular and molecular events to how they actually exert their health conferring benefits. And I personally think we're a long way away from that. So we've got all this stuff that we can do, all this stuff that we can measure, we now have to put it into practice. So we have to get from, if you like, bedside to bench and back again. And this is the slide I talked about. Some of you will have seen this in The Economist. Okay. But we will just show that very briefly. So thank you, first of all, and it wouldn't be possible, you know, the university have been great. I've never, you know, received such generous support for the group. And as I say, when I looked around on the roof last night, we have a really good, and I'm glad you stressed it, time, uh, time and team. There are no individuals in our group. We've just got a great group of guys. And, you know, I look around, I think, what a great group. So, guys, you're the, you're the tops. We've got good collaborators elsewhere. We've got Jotin, who's going to talk to you later. Uh, Luke as well. We've got Louise who's going to come and talk to you from the AIS. But again, it wouldn't be possible without all these partners and funding bodies. So thank you for that, and I'll leave it uh, on time.